we are starting our journey in the Indian town of Rishikesh. The small town with about 70,000 inhabitants is about 220 kilometers away from the capital, New Delhi. The river Ganges flows through the town and every year, thousands of pilgrims come here to pray at its holy banks. In 1968, this place suddenly got famous when the Beatles came here. They lived in an ashram, a kind of monastery, and we're setting out to find this place. Beatles ashram, huh? Ah, Beatles, ah. Beatles ashram, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, It wasn't possible to make an appointment in advance, so first of all we ask if we're allowed to film. The signs say that we have to pay an entrance fee. For Indians it's about two dollars and for tourists it is eight. But the guard looks skeptically at our camera. We're allowed to come in, but our camera isn't. So we'll try again the next day. A little way away from the riverbank, we set off our drone, and we see a huge area with odd-looking domed structures. Everything seems to be deserted. A razor wire fence surrounds the whole facility. We're excited to see if we'll still be able to find any traces of the Beatles. We're driving back into town in order to find a hotel. On our way, we notice how many ashrams there are here. Everywhere, yoga centers are advertising their courses. Rishikesh is a real magnet for tourists. But what makes this place so special? We ask a real Indian tourist. Every Hindu should visit this place. So once in his life? Once in, at least once in his life. Mm -hmm. But it is so happened that once you come here, it, you, you feel like coming here again and again. It's like you don't feel like going back. To find out what will be expecting us in the Beatles ashram tomorrow, we're visiting one of the most popular ashrams in town. Thousands of pilgrims come here every year. A holiday in an ashram is very popular among Indian and foreign tourists alike. Many stay here for a couple of weeks and everyone only pays what they can afford. We're meeting one of the employees, Laurie. She explains the rules to us. And are there some kind of rules if I come to the ashram? Well, there are a few rules, um, very minimal, okay. Um, as you might be aware, Rishikesh is a, whole, is a designated holy city. Mm -hmm. Consequently, there uh, are no legal alcohol sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is vegetarian, mm -hmm. so there's no meat or fish or eggs. These are the same rules that applied to the Beatles back then, and the day is completely structured. The food is vegetarian and the same for everybody. Also the same as when the Beatles were here. Today, deep fried potatoes, a vegetable curry, rice and a spicy flatbread are on the menu. The price, 80 cents for lunch and 20 cents for coffee. Some only come here to eat. We go looking for someone who actually lives here. Hi, sorry, may I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Yes? You're staying here in the ashram? Uh, I don't know yet. You want to? Yeah. Why? Uh, I'm a big Beatles fan, so... You're a big Beatles fan? Yeah. The next morning, we are on our way to the Beatles ashram again, this time with Vincent. He's a big fan and wants to play one of their songs where they stayed, preferably where they slept. Again, we ask for permission to shoot here. And this time we're allowed to. The guard gets a little pocket money of 3,000 rupees, around $40, and we're allowed to film inside the ashram. So this is the place where the Beatles were. The four Englishmen were the most famous pop stars in the world back then, and wherever the band showed up, mass hysteria broke out. Their song, Yesterday, is the most covered pop song of all time. Oh, I believe in yesterday. 
Although everything here looks as if it were from yesterday now, back then this place was quite luxurious. There was even electricity. So these strange-looking structures used to be real houses with two stories. Downstairs there is a small room that was used for sleeping in. And the view from upstairs is phenomenal. So apparently the Beatles slept somewhere here, but in which house? We carry on walking across the compound and see that there are over 100 honeycomb houses. Do you know where the Beatles stayed when they were here? Uh, I think over there. In if you go straight, there is a, uh, uh, there's a house yeah. which is said that we were staying over there. And okay, it's behind the meditation hall at yeah, the left you side? Yeah, you have to go straight. Okay, go straight. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but on the way, there is more to see. There is this abandoned hall in the middle of nowhere. But what is this supposed to be? In order to find out, we have a look inside. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. According to the walls, many Beatles fans were already here. This building too was used as accommodation, but we can't find any clues that the Beatles slept here. The stairs take us up to the roof. In these domes, it was possible to meditate in the shade as the sun burns down relentlessly here. We carry on searching for the Beatles house. But on the way, we first of all only find where Maharishi Mahesh Yogi lived. He used to be the boss here back then. With his meditation technique, he became very famous in the 60s. In order to understand what fascinated the Beatles so much about a guru, we join into an arti. In these, the guru meets his followers at the riverbank to pray. We have asked for an interview, but the guru will not decide yet if he's going to speak to us afterwards. Then everything happens very fast. We are picked up. The guru wants to speak to us. Thank you. We're not alone with the guru, but in a small elected group. We have to write our questions down first and are then allowed to ask one of them. I would like to know why do people look for a guru? Not the guru himself, but one of his assistants answers the question. The word guru literally means the remover of darkness. And so as we look at it, we ask ourselves, what darkness? What darkness is it that we are needing to remove? A guru like this has a big attractive force. Just like the Beatles, we too are fascinated by it. Since 1990, there hasn't been a guru at the Beatles ashram. Now they are looking for a new one. New life is meant to return here. On our search for the Beatles house, we find the meditation hall where everyone comes together in the morning. The Beatles lived here for several weeks. 48 songs were composed in this time. To be able to have some peace and quiet, there are over 50 meditation cells. It was possible to retreat to these to meditate, sometimes for days at a time. Now we want to finally find the house of the Beatles, but first we come across another hall that is covered in graffiti. Beatles fans drew these, but originally this place was used for prayer. And in India, this is always done with lots of music. So cool, right? Yeah. This inspired the Beatles to many songs back in the day. We want to now finally find their house. Do you know if this is the place where they stayed? No, I don't know. You don't know? OK. We simply can't find it by ourselves, so we ask the guard at the entrance. Do you know where John Lennon slept? In which, in which chamber? Yeah, nine number hut, upside, number two gate, nine, 10, 11, 12. OK. They are slept. Outside. OK. 
So the Beatles really slept in a little hut like this. We search for number nine and really find it. A fan painted John Lennon's portrait here, and finally Vincent can fulfill his dream. The four megastars will also have sat here 48 years ago to play the guitar. We leave this fascinating place and travel on to Zushu in China. Three hours drive away from Shanghai, an exact copy of London's Tower Bridge can be found. We want to see what this copy is all about. How close to the original are the replicas of well-known landmarks? First of all, the two do a selfie test. Will other people notice that they aren't actually in London? Most don't notice, but if they looked closely, they would notice something. Opposed to the original from the River Thames, this bridge is supported by four and not two pillars. But if observed from the right angle, the replica looks deceptively genuine. All around the bridge, we see dozens of wedding couples and numerous photographers. The fake landmark seems to be a real hotspot when it comes to souvenir pictures. But that's not the end of it. <laughs> For the Chinese, it is difficult to get a European visa, so they just make Europe come to them. But not only Europe, Las Vegas is also not far. In Macau, a replica of the famous gambling city is being built. We want to find out if the Chinese clone can keep up with the American original. Since 2001, gambling has been legal in Macau. Since then, investors have been busy building replicas. The famous Venetian is even bigger than the original. It is the biggest casino in the world. But the original strip in Las Vegas has a length of a whole 6.8 kilometers. In Macau, the street where the casinos are located is a mere 900 meters long. So, the dimensions here are completely different. But can at least the replica of the Venetian live up to its name? Just as in America, the aim was to create an atmosphere like in Venice. So we are in the Chinese imitation of the American imitation of Venice. Can this work? At least finding our room is similar to the real Las Vegas experience. It takes us almost 20 minutes until we reach our suite on the 39th floor. And we can't complain about the suite itself at all. 54 square meters of finest Italian flair. But at about $250, they are significantly more expensive than their American counterparts. All in all, the biggest casino in the world does impress us with its size of around seven football fields. And after dark, some atmosphere does arise, even though more artists than tourists are out on the strip. Everyone seems to be inside the gambling halls with their 3,400 machines and 800 gaming tables. But sometimes merely copying the original just isn't enough, even though it might look quite nice at night. We're leaving China and are traveling to Canada. To be more specific, to Vancouver Island. The island in the Pacific is a popular tourist attraction and the town of Tofino is the set-off point for lots of boat tours. We are looking for Freedom Cove and now just need to find someone to take us there. Oh, Freedom Cove, yeah, I can take you guys there. Okay, is that a well-known place around here? Yeah, fairly well-known. Those people are pretty famous for their floating garden. 
The locals call this floating paradise Freedom Cove, and the boat ride along the picturesque coastline is already pretty close to being paradisial. After about 30 minutes, we have arrived. There it is, right in front of us, a floating platform with a couple of mismatching houses. Someone has really creatively expressed themselves here. We're excited to see what awaits us. Ah, so these two dogs for a start. And then they emerge, the constructors of this topsy-turvy house. How are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Look. We would like to see your place, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Well, nice nice to, to meet you. I'm Sasha. I'm Catherine. Hello, Catherine yes. I'm Wayne. Hello, Wayne. Nice to meet you. We feel as if we're entering another world, a colourful fantasy world. Wayne Adams and his wife Catherine have been living here in their floating paradise for 23 years. The main house was the first thing they built. A storm had scattered many logs all over the cove and the owners didn't want the wood. For Wayne, this was the big chance. Yeah, all the framework to this whole building came from a storm in 23 years ago. And that's all clear yellow cedar wood. Over the years, more and more additional buildings were added. They did this all by themselves. Today, there is a gallery, five greenhouses, a lighthouse, a workshop, and a boathouse. Everything is made from recycled materials that you're walking on. Uh, old fish farm systems that they were discarding. All the canvas comes from tents from a resort that can't use them anymore. It wouldn't have been possible any other way because the two of them primarily live off Wayne's small pension and don't have a lot of money. All my place is built with basically through barter trade and money. I've had moments where I've had money where I could buy things, but 60% of what I've done has been beachcombed and bartered for. There is no electricity in this paradise. The house is small, but it looks quite cozy. In the kitchen, there is a gas stove. A fridge doesn't exist here. But what the two do have is a completely kitted out bathroom. So here we have our bathroom. And as you can see, it's a regular bathroom, just like everyone else's. The only difference is it's floating. The couple are mainly self-sufficient. Catherine grows salad, beans, apples, and many other fruit and vegetables in the outdoor area, as well as in her five greenhouses. Every couple of weeks, usually, we go to Tofino. It can go longer in the winter if the weather is too bad. Um, but we can do just fine out here if, if we were stuck here for months or if everything went down in the world, we would be all right. <laughs> Catherine lived in a town until her children had grown up, but she only rarely misses her old life. You have your moments where you miss some of the things that you have in the city, um, movie theaters or just going to the corner store, but those are just fleeting things that come through. Catherine takes care of the garden, and Wayne is responsible for catching fish. He usually does so with his son, Shane. After over 20 years, Wayne knows the best spots in the area. He pulls one fish after the other out of the water. Get lots of nibbles, but... I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> it's a... Uh can be a hot spot, depending on what, you know, the time of day and the tides. Daily chore number two, making firewood. The dropouts always have to make sure that there is enough wood for the winter. Therefore, they fill up the store over the summer. Shane grew up with his parents in the city, but for the last 10 years, he's also been living in the cove. No. I don't regret moving out here ever. 
That's one of the best decisions I've ever made. I don't have to worry about running out and making sure I make enough money to pay all my bills this month. Right? Uh, if I've got enough gas to run, power my generator, then I'm doing okay, right? Shane used to be a chef and made good money. After a burnout, he moved to the Calm Cove, and his parents have been the living proof for 23 years that this kind of life is possible. An important rule, the food only travels short distances here. From the boat, the fish go directly into the pan. Wayne and Catherine lead a life completely without frozen foods or ready meals. Well, the beauty of living out here is, is we've, we, we, in the last 23 years, we've never had a fridge, and we eat fresh, everything we have, we eat fresh. So we don't keep anything. Well, I can keep my crab in a live trap, so I can gather a few ahead for when I get company coming. It doesn't get any fresher than this. It only takes the fish fillets a few minutes from the water to the pan. Catherine's kitchen may be small, but it is completely kitted out. With lots of ingenuity, the two even managed to install running water in their house. Uh, we have a waterfall that comes from an old lake that we've dammed up and we're able to gravity feed all the water over through piping into my hoses for the garden and into the plumbing for the house. It is tricks like these with which the family has managed to have at least some comforts here in the wilderness. If you feel like also living this life now, it isn't completely free to live here. They have to pay a kind of land tax to the municipality. In the evening, we head back to civilization and say goodbye to two people who are happy living without a TV or a fridge. Now we're traveling on to the USA. Our journey starts in the middle of nowhere in the state of West Virginia, USA. The small village of Greenbank barely has 500 inhabitants and it is cut off from the outside world in a mysterious way because mobile usage or internet surfing are forbidden. And not only are they forbidden, but nothing actually functions. While our reporters are filming impressions of the village, this strange vehicle comes up to them. Excuse me, gentlemen. Are you using some sort of wireless device or uh, something with Wi-Fi in it that's uh, on one of your cameras or whatever? I think the camera, is that, is that a problem? Well, I was picking it up as I was doing a scan for interference to the observatory and, it, and I saw one that said uh, GoPro. All right, so yeah. I can, so oh, that, yeah. and that looks like a GoPro. Oh, so. no. Chuck Nide is Greenbank's radio signal police. His truck is equipped with measurement devices to locate radio signals like Wi-Fi or mobile phones. See right there, GoPro SSP, that's probably your camera. And we can see it has a, has a very good signal here. Okay. And, and your little device here could cause an interference to the, to the telescope. It, we turn off the camera's Wi-Fi and are permitted to continue filming. But devices that transmit radio signals are unwanted in Greenbank. The reason is a very special research station to which Chuck will take us now. The Robert C. Byrd Greenbank Telescope is standing right in the middle of this small town. It's the largest radio telescope in the world. This is where we meet Mike Holstein. He is the technical director of this observatory, and he takes us along. Thanks to him, we're allowed to get very close to the telescope, but only with a diesel vehicle. The telescope is extremely sensitive to any radio frequency interference, and the gasoline engine uh, has a spark plug that provides the combustion 
to allow the engine to go and that spark in the spark plug actually is a form of explosive energy so it, it gives off radio frequency interference that the telescope can, can see it can drown out the data the astronomer is looking for the telescope is 147 meters high The dish itself is as large as a soccer pitch. The scientists receive radio signals from space. These signals are very, very weak. That's why the telescope is extremely sensitive. The larger the dish of a telescope, the more sensitive it is. Radio signals are invisible to the human eye. With radio telescopes, scientists can look into other galaxies as far away as 10 billion light years. Uh, that's equivalent to the energy given off by a single snowflake hitting the ground. So a single cell phone on Mars would be the, the brightest radio object to us in the sky. Universities and NASA use the telescope to learn more about gas clouds, other galaxies, and the sun. Wolfgang Baudler, IT expert from Germany, is jointly responsible for the computer center. Wolfgang Baudler has been working at the institute for 15 years. Since then, he's been living in Greenbank, without a smartphone or Wi-Fi. This National Radio Quiet Zone was installed in 1958. In this area, any kind of electronic transmitters are prohibited. The residents within spitting distance of the telescope are not allowed to use Wi-Fi. Chuck Nide makes sure they don't. But technological progress doesn't stop short of Greenbank. And we have one already. All right, got already. There's two, there's three. Oh <laughs> no, it's like your Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi or mobile phones sending signals in a specific frequency range interfere with the measurements. We, we go and ask if they'll shut it off. All right. And most of the time they will. Uh, there are some that uh, refuse. And we, we have no enforcement powers. We can't tell people they they have to turn off their device. If you use Wi-Fi, you have to pay a fine of $50. Living without a mobile phone is unthinkable for many people nowadays, especially for young people. For the inhabitants of Greenbank, it's part of their everyday life, and most people actually like it. Debbie is 24 and works at the only supermarket in town. She likes living in a mobile-free zone. No, I guess where I'm from, I was just used to having it all the time, and here you just you just adapt, you know, to not needing it all the time. I still have one, but for when I take trips. So, but most of the time it stays in my purse. <laughs> it's so much more personal to talk to someone. It's face to face. You can see the emotion. You get the connection. No confusion, you know? Communication in Greenbank works like in the good old days, via landline and telephone booth. Calling Debbie costs 50 cents. She moved to Greenbank out of her free will because of the radio silence. TV, microwave oven, coffee machine. It's all there. What she doesn't have is Wi-Fi and a mobile phone. A bill paying, that's definitely an inconvenience. I have to send everything off in envelope form, which is old school now. I mean, you can pay your bills on the internet all the time, which is what most people do. Debbie doesn't use the internet at all. She makes appointments via landline telephone. That takes some getting used to. Well, you see it, I was just making a, trying to make an appointment for my son at the allergy clinic. Obviously, I didn't get a hold of them, so I'm going to have to play the waiting game for them to call me back. I can't just head out, drive down the road to work, or um, go to the school, pick up my son, and have a call saying, oh, it's okay to bring him in. No, I have to wait by my phone at home or at work for their phone call. To work in a different state that you live in. 
she also has to make concessions in her private life. There are not many jobs in Green Bank. That's why her husband works in a different state and can only come home for the weekends. But what do the local teenagers say, growing up without modern technology? We asked the kids at the local high school. Many parents would probably be delighted to hear the answers. I think that we're kind of privileged to not have cell phones all the time because we are, we're more connected with the, the community around us and our environment. And I mean, I personally am glad that I don't have to deal with having a cell phone. Teenagers who actually talk to one another instead of chatting on their mobile. Maybe every school should be declared a no-go area for electronic devices. I like it here. I don't think we should be able to be on the internet all the time because it helps me be more social with everybody. Like, I know almost everybody in the school talks to them a lot. Whereas I know in it, Greenbrier East, it's pretty close to here. It's a big school. They hardly talk to anybody. It's, you talk to your friends and that's all you talk to. And so I think it's good that we don't have internet. For the very first time, the teenagers will experience at university what it's like to be constantly online. Debbie chose Green Bank on purpose. She wants her son Colton to grow up without the distraction of computers and the internet. This is, this is the, in my opinion, one of the best places to be and have children. The inhabitants of Green Bank live in their mysterious place as if they were in a bubble. So the scientists can listen to sounds from outer space unhindered and maybe one day find another form of life there. From the USA, it's on to Natal in Brazil. The city is known for its long sandy beaches and widespread dunes, but apparently here there is also a one tree park. We ask the locals. How far? Cashew nuts are sold here in lots of variations on every corner. In this place, everything is about cashews. So we can't be too far away from the One Tree Park anymore. O casoeiro. Huh? É o casoeiro? Sim, 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 sim. Uh, uh, uh. Sim. This way? Onde é? Para lá. This way? Para direita. A few kilometers on, we discover the viewing platform that was also in the picture. We have arrived. The view is tremendous. And this is all supposed to be one tree? From above, it looks more as if many trees were stood very close together. So we delve down into the park. Underneath the leaves, it feels as if we were completely cut off from the outside world. Especially constructed paths lead through the many branches. It feels like being in the woods. From here too, it looks more like many trees. It is unbelievable that this is meant to be just one tree. We speak to the head groundskeeper, João Maria. He is the only person that is allowed to cut or clip anything here. The giant cashew tree needs special attention because the reason for its incredible growth are two gene mutations. So does this mean that the tree is sick? Segundo os especialistas que falam que ele tem uns, uns anéis no tronco, pode viver de 15, cada, por cada rosa que ela tem no tronco dela. Assim, quando o galho toca o chão, esse galho que encostou o chão ele vai criar uma raiz. Ali ele vai fixar o chão como se fosse um novo tronco. Aí no que ele cresce, o galho vai se estirando pelo chão de novo e vai continuando a criar raiz e crescer para cima. E... Some of the branches are so heavy and long that they need to be supported in order for them not to break. 
Normal cashew trees look like this. They grow to a size of 10 to 12 meters and are relatively straight. Only right at the end do they form the crown of the tree. The centerpiece of the huge cashew tree is pretty much right in the middle of the park. The main stem. We are in a sea of branches that hang in the air and lie on the ground like snakes. And they all have one origin, this tree trunk. Over the past 115 years, the tree has spread to its current size from this place. By the way, the shape of its nuts is the reason for the name of the tree. Caju means something like kidney tree in Portuguese. And that's exactly what the kernels or the nuts of this tree look like. Even outside of Brazil, everyone knows these nuts by now. Less well known are the fruit of the cashew tree. In Brazil, it is almost even more popular than the cashew nut. From the outside, it looks a little bit like a pepper. The special thing about the fruit, the nuts aren't in it, but on top of the fruit. It is possible to eat the fruit as a whole, including the skin. The cashew fruit has a sort of solid pulp and no seeds. During our visit, the fruit was out of season, but at the beginning of the year, the giant cashew tree is also full of fruit. But is it possible to eat them? After all, the tree does have a gene defect. Francesco Candoso tells us that it is. He is the manager here and responsible for the park. É normalidade. Inclusive, a própria fruto dele, a castanha, quando é plantada, não sai um caju, ou seja, não nasce um caju igual a esse, com a mesma normalia desse. É como se fosse um cajueiro normal. In the shade of the main trunk, the tourist guide tells us all about the evolution of the tree. Who originally planted it isn't quite clear. Some say that it was a fisherman named Luis de Oliveira in 1888. But there's also a small type of monkey that feed off the cashew nuts. As the outside of the nuts is poisonous and has to be removed, the monkeys bury them until it has rotted away. So maybe a buried nut was simply forgotten, and then this tree grew from it. All attempts of growing another giant cashew tree from its seeds have unfortunately failed to this day. In Brazil, the tree is a huge attraction. 3,000 visitors per day come to see the One Tree Park during the main season. But the guide tells us that there is a problem. The tree is simply growing far too quickly. Per year, it grows one meter in every direction, and around it, there isn't any more space. If this continues, the tree will overgrow the whole neighborhood within the next decades. For over 10 years, the tree hasn't been cropped for fear of destroying it. It already reaches far into the street, which is cause for annoyance to the neighbors, because this already causes problems on the roads. O engarrafamento acontece esse acidente porque o outro lado não quer respeitar esse, entendeu? Eu aconselharia que podasse. Só podasse. Na rua. Só na lateral. Só na lateral aqui. Só na lateral. Of course, for all the souvenir shops around the tree, the many tourists are a blessing. But in the area, there are also many beach houses, and their owners have a different view of the situation. The park owners would like to buy up the surrounding houses and tear them down. But many neighbors don't want this to happen. It is a dispute that has been ongoing for years. How it will end, only time will tell. And in the future, even more tourists could come to visit the tree. At the moment, an application to the Guinness Book of Records is being reviewed. 
if the tree may not only be called the biggest cashew tree in the world, but, because of its yield, the biggest fruit-bearing tree on Earth. And apparently, the chances are pretty good. From Brazil, our journey takes us on to Israel. To the Negev Desert. It takes up 60% of the country, but only 10% of the population live here. And then suddenly, bright green mountains. Is this art, a garden, or maybe even toxic waste? No. From close up, you can see it is glass. To be more exact, bottles and shards. Tons of it. And right behind them, some kind of factory. A quick look online shows us this isn't a mirage. There are really tons of glass here in the middle of the desert. The factory produces glass bottles for Coca-Cola, for example. And to be able to do so, among other things, it needs recycled glass. But what for exactly? And why is a huge bottle factory like this located right in the desert? Isn't that completely crazy? We want to take a closer look and drive to the desert factory. It is a three-hour drive away from Tel Aviv in a small, sleepy town. In the factory, we are first of all given protective gear. Safety shoes and clothing too, despite the heat. The outside temperature is at 45 degrees at the moment, but safety is of the essence here as there are shards of glass lying around everywhere. Production manager Rothschild Katsyaf shows us the glass mounds that we have up to now only seen in pictures. Some of these are 15 meters high. 30,000 tons are lying around here, all sorted by color, depending on which color of bottle is to be produced. Waste for others is gold for us. Uh, the value of this uh, broken glass, this colour, is uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for us. Constantly new deliveries arrive. Recycled glass is important for the production of new bottles because if it has already melted once, it will melt faster the second time. Mixed with the other raw materials, this shortens the melting process during the production. This saves energy and money. For the bottle production, it is sufficient if 90% is of the same color. Only when it comes to clear glass, it has to be 100%. A single bottle of the wrong color would ruin everything. We even discover beer bottles from Germany. The whole world is represented here. Rothschild doesn't even have to look at the labels to know where the bottles originated from. On each of them, there are codes with mysterious numbers and symbols, only legible to insiders. You can see the year that the glass was produced. You can see the sign of the factory and also the mold number it was produced from. So you pretty much have a lot of information on the bottle. We are battling with the heat, 45 degrees, but we don't even suspect that this is nothing compared to the heat inside the production plant where Coke bottles are being made right now. It is somewhere between 70 and 100 degrees here, but we will only find this out later. For the sand, the most important raw material for the glass, we first of all have to go even deeper into the desert. The extraction site is inside this huge crater. Three of these exist in Israel, and they are unique in the world. The oldest sand layers here are 200 million years old. The dinosaurs probably already walked on them. Back to the glass factory. To make glass, except sand, you also need the recycled glass from the glass mounds outside the factory. In this case, clear glass for the Coke bottles. Then limestone and other minerals like soda, dolomite rock and potash are added, as well as colouring agents. But not for clear glass, of course. Everything is thoroughly mixed and the compound is ready for the melting process. 
Speaking of melting, we are too. But it's only about to be really hot now. Off to the furnace. Guys, let's go. It's very noisy and very hot outside. Be careful. The production manager wasn't exaggerating. It is between 70 and 100 degrees in the production area, depending on where exactly you are. After five minutes, we feel like in a sauna. Because it isn't just hot, but also too noisy for an interview. We communicate via mobile phone. Rothschild types, I love to sweat. He must be a little bit crazy. The reason for the incredible heat are, of course, the huge brick furnaces. It takes a devilish 1,600 degrees to turn the sand mixture into glass. It is only possible to look at this hellish fire through a special foil or protective glasses. Otherwise, it would burn your eyeballs off. If one were to stand here for too long, one would at some point simply catch fire, even if the flames aren't directly touched. By now, our equipment is almost too hot to touch, and two tripods have even melted. In a decommissioned furnace, production manager Rothschild shows us what it looks like inside. You can see here the entrance of the raw material. Uh, they come through here, uh, and the combustion is happening here. The raw material uh, flows over the, the molten glass. It melts gradually and flows uh, to, the, to the front side and then going uh, out of the furnace through the throat. The furnace, the centerpiece of the factory. It takes 24 hours for the sand mixture to completely melt and pass through the oven. One meter 60, that is the height of the smoldering raw material in the oven. During the melting process, compressed air is pumped into the oven from below. This helps to evenly mix the raw materials and prevents impurities in the glass. In the control room, the oven is under constant surveillance. This is what the super oven looks like from the inside while it is in action. It runs 24 hours per day on 365 days of the year and is never turned off. It would take 16 days to get it back to working temperature, which would be far too expensive. And then there is another reason why it's never turned off. The liquid mass would become solid immediately. This happens very quickly, as we can see with this drop of molten glass. If that were to happen, the glass could block and destroy the oven. Therefore, it is constantly in action. After 24 hours, the sand mixture has turned to glass and shoots out of the oven. It still has a temperature of 1,200 degrees. A water-cooled machine cuts it into easy-to-handle pieces. Each of these has exactly the size and the weight so that it is possible to form one Coke bottle out of it. Here, the pieces are shot into the different production lines. Then it's time for the shaping process. This machine gives the Coke bottles their typical shape within just a few seconds. And speed is of the essence here, as up to a million bottles are produced here per day. Over and over, workers clean the moulds while the machines are running, because they are never turned off, as we already know. In our opinion, this is the toughest job in the factory. It isn't quite as hot as next to the furnaces, where the employees can only spend short amounts of time. Here, the staff spend eight hours per shift in 70-degree heat. We can't even bear it for a couple of minutes. The only place for the workers to cool off is the break room. In a quieter corner, we ask one of them how they manage. <laughs> The freshly formed bottles are still extremely hot and very fragile. A bit of cold water and they burst. 
This is what it looks like in slow motion. Therefore, the bottles have to go through a 550 degrees hot oven. Despite its high temperature, it is called the cooling oven. The still red hot bottles slowly cool down inside it. When they come out at the other side, they aren't quite as fragile anymore. If this was enough, is checked on a random sample. The hammer test proves if the bottle can withstand impacts in four different places. This machine puts filled bottles under pressure. They have to cope with 20 bar without exploding. This one here bursts at 42. After all, a bottle like this has to go through a lot, like lying in the sun for hours. Machines and employees screen and check all the bottles in many steps. The inspectors are looking for little bubbles or tears, for example. And if needed, adjust the machines. Clear glass is especially tricky. Even the smallest imperfections are visible. But even when something does go wrong, nothing is thrown away. Faulty bottles and shards of broken glass go one story down. Here, the glass is cooled down, shredded and washed. Then it's back onto the mound in the desert. The never-ending cycle of bottles. And now, finally, we can water the deserts in our mouths with water from oven-fresh Coke bottles.